Hey, welcome to the Whistleblower Newsroom. I'm Christina Borgeson with my co-host Celia Farber. Today, we have the amazing privilege of having on the show the author of what I think is arguably the ultimate whistleblower book that shows with facts and pos positive examples of solutions that have worked unequivocally how consumerism, materialism, the biomedical and drug industries, and other mainstay institutions of our society that promote disconnection, <clears throat> distance, competition over collaboration, and other forms of disconnection are literally driving us into depression and suicide and keeping us all living in sick societies. But Johan Hari's 2018 book, Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions, is way more than that. What this book really is, is a roadmap for planetary, social, and spiritual transformation. I know that sounds huge, but I'm not kidding. I really think it is that. It is a step-by-step -step manual for leading us all out of the current pharmacological, spiritual, and material nightmare in which we are all living. The insights and information in Lost Connections were hard won by Johan, who was depressed since he was a child and finally ready to kill himself, decided to dispense with all the antidepressants he was taking that didn't work and made him feel worse, and to go on a global journey to give life one more chance to show him that he could be saved and that it was worth living. That journey has paid off big time for Johan, as well as the rest of us, because it resulted in his writing Lost Connections, which is truly a gift to the world, even more so now, in the age of the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Johan. Hey, Christina. It's so nice to be with you. So I guess we should start with a little bit of background. Tell us a little bit about your journey and, and how you ended up doing this amazing book. Well, I guess for me, it was because there were these two kind of mysteries that were really hanging over me. The first mystery is uh, I'm 41 years old and all throughout my lifetime, depression and anxiety have increased in the United States, in Britain, and in fact, across the entire Western world. And I wanted to understand why, right? Why is this happening to us? Why is it that with each year that passes, more and more of us are finding it harder to get through the day, right? what's going on and i wanted to understand that because as you alluded to in your intro uh, there was a more personal mystery going on for me which is that when i was a teenager i remember going to my doctor and explaining that i had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me that i didn't understand it i couldn't control it i was quite ashamed of it and my doctor told me a story that i now realize was well-intentioned but really oversimplified my doctor said, well, we know why people get like this. Some people just naturally have a chemical imbalance in their brains. Oh. You're clearly one of them. All we need to do is give you some drugs. You're going to be fine. So I was given a chemical antidepressant called Paxil, and it did give me some relief for a while. Uh, but At what age was this? Did you got Paxil? I was a teenager, so I was about, I was about 17 or 18. Your parents and didn't, like, freak out about that? No, no, my parents were <laughs> had other things going on in their lives, but the the they, they were pretty uh, out of it by then. But the the you know uh, and I, quite quickly this feeling of pain started to come back. So I went back to my doctor. My doctor said, "Well, clearly we didn't give you a high enough dose." I get I was given a, a higher dose again. I felt a little bit better. Again, this feeling of pain came back and got to the point where I was taking the maximum possible dose that you're allowed to take for 13 years. And at the end of those 13 years, I was kind of asking myself, well, okay, what's going on here? Because I'm doing everything I'm being told to do according to the story our culture tells about depression and anxiety. And yet I still feel awful. What's, what's going on here? So to kind of get to the bottom of this, I ended up going on a really big journey all over the world. I ended up traveling over 40,000 miles. I wanted to meet the leading scientific experts in the world about what causes depression and anxiety and crucially what solves them. And just people with a very different range of perspectives from an Amish village in Indiana, because the Amish have very low levels of depression, to a city in Brazil that banned advertising to see if that made people feel better, to a lab in Baltimore where they were giving people psychedelics to see if that helped. And, and I, I learned a huge amount. But the heart of what I learned is 
there's scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety that we know about so far. Two of them are indeed in our biology. So what my doctor said wasn't totally wrong. Um, there are real brain changes that happen when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out. And your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems, though they never write your destiny. But actually, the most striking thing that I learned is most of the causes of depression and anxiety that we have evidence for, seven of the nine, are not factors in our biology. They're factors in the way we live. And once you understand them, it opens up a very different understanding of how we got to this situation and, crucially, a whole new range of ways out of it. Okay. So let's start. Let's. I mean, this is what's so beautiful about this book. It's super clear. It lays it out. Okay, these are the causes that make you depressed. So if you could just give us the little master class here <laughs> on that. Because, yeah. and tell us the stories, because there's one story I just, I'll never forget that story about that. I'm just moved even when I think about it. That woman in Berlin. Oh, yeah. You know, that Turkish woman. It's so interesting that you say that because, you know, I was taught a huge amount by the scientists I got to know. A huge amount of what is in the book is driven by the scientific evidence about what causes depression and the solutions. But, you know, you've gone, essentially, you've done that, Christina, you've gone right to the, the, the people I think who taught me the most in all the research for my book were not scientists and doctors. They were exactly the group of people you mentioned. So in the summer of 2011, on a big anonymous housing project in Berlin, a, a woman named Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and she put a sign in her window. Um, Nuria lived on the ground floor. And the sign she put up said something like, I got a notice saying I'm going to be evicted from my apartment next Thursday night. So on Wednesday, I'm going to kill myself. Now, this housing project is, is called Cotty. And it, it's a kind of, it, it was in a poor part of Berlin. Uh, and for a long time, there'd only really been three groups of people who lived in this housing project. There were recent Muslim immigrants like this woman, Nuria. There were gay men and there were punk squatters. And as you can imagine, these three groups did not get along, but no one really knew anyone. It was completely anonymous. Um, uh, it was a very lonely place with a lot of people who were depressed and anxious. And people started to walk past Nuria's door. And of course, they saw this sign in her window. And people were like, this is awful. And so they started to knock on her door. They said, do you need any help? And she said, I won't use the exact word she said. She said, screw you. I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself. And she shut the door in, in their faces. And People started talking outside her apartment. They didn't know each other, but they started talking. And a lot of people uh, in this, in Cotty and in this part of Berlin and across Berlin, in fact, were their rents had been going up and up and up. The city was gentrifying very rapidly. And lots of people were either had been evicted or were afraid of being evicted. So they really connected with the pain this woman felt. And one of them had an idea. There's a big thoroughfare that goes through this housing project into the center of Berlin. And one of them said, you know, if on Saturday we just block the road for a day and we protest, there'll probably be a bit, be a bit of media coverage. Um, there'll probably be a bit of a fuss. They might let this woman stay in her apartment. There might even be some pressure to keep our rents down more generally. Why don't we do it? So Saturday came. They blocked the road and protested, the people who lived on this housing project. Nuria, the woman who put this sign in her window, was like, ah, oh, I'm going to kill myself. I might as well let them push me into the middle of the street. So Nuria gets wheeled out. The media come. It's a bit of a news story in Berlin that day. And then it gets to the end of the day and the police turn up and they say, OK, you've had your fun. Take all this down, clear the road. But the people who lived in Cotty said, well, hang on a minute. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. In fact, what we want is a rent freeze for our entire housing project, including her. Once we've got that guarantee, then we'll take this down. But we're not going to take it down till then. But of course, they knew the minute they walked away from this barricade, the police would just tear it down anyway. That would be the end of it. So one of my favorite people in Cotty, a woman named Tanya Gartner, she's one of the punk squatters. She wears tiny little mini skirts, even in Berlin winter. She's quite hardcore. Uh, Tanya said, well, in her apartment, she had um, a klaxon, those things that make super loud noises at soccer matches. So she went and got it. She said, OK, everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to draw up a timetable to man this barricade 24 hours a day until Nuria gets told she can stay and we get a rent freeze for our whole housing project. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade. We're going to do it in pairs and we're going to do it until we win. So 
people start signing up to man this barricade, right? People who had never met and would never have met. And he started to get these very unlikely pairings. So Tanya, in her tiny little miniskirt, was paired with Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab. And they got, if I remember right, they had the Wednesday night shifts. And Tanya and Nuria sat there next to each other. And they were like, we have got nothing to talk about. This is so awkward. It's so embarrassing. They sat there the first few nights in silence. As the nights went on, they started talking. And Tanya and Nuria discovered they had something incredibly powerful in common. Um, Nuria had come to Berlin when she was 17 years old from her village in Turkey. And she came with her two babies. And she was meant to earn enough money to send back home to her husband in Turkey so he could come and join her. But she worked unbelievably hard for two years. And then just before she had the money, she got word from home that her husband had died. Sitting there in the cold in Kotti with Tanya, she told her something she'd never told anyone in Germany before. She'd always said to people in Germany that her husband had died of a heart attack. Actually, she told Tanya he died of tuberculosis, which was seen at the time as a kind of shameful disease of poverty. That's when Tanya started to talk about something she never talked about. Tanya had found her way to Kotti when she was even younger than Nuria had been. She'd been 15 years old. She'd been thrown out by her middle class family because they hated that she was obsessed with punk. And she found her way to a squat in Kotti. And not long after she arrived, she realized she was pregnant. Nuria and Tanya realized that they had both been children with children of their own in this place that they didn't understand. They realized they... They were incredibly similar. They became really good friends. Uh, Pairings like this were happening all over Cotty. Directly opposite this housing project, there's a a gay club called Zudblock that had been a couple of years before the protest. Uh, It's run by a man I love called Rick Kutstein, who, (laughs) to give you a sense of what he's like, the previous gay club he owned was called Cafe Anal. Right. Uh, um, it's pretty, pretty kind of hardcore. I always thought you were going to have a sandwich. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a pretty kind of hardcore gay club. And when they open this club, you know, this is an area with a lot of very religious Muslims. You know, some people have been really pissed off. Some people had smashed their windows. There'd been, you know, some significant pushback. And when the protests began, the staff at Zudblock started giving everyone, you know, they gave all their furniture to the protest. And after the protests had been going on for a few months, uh, the people at Zudblock said, you know, you guys could start having your meetings in our club if you want. We'll give you free food and drink. And even the people who were kind of veteran lefty progressives in Cotty were like, look, we're not going to get these very religious Muslims to come and have meetings <laughs> underneath posters for things so obscene. I can't say them on your radio show. Right. Um, but it did start to happen. As one of the Turkish German women there, Neriman Manker, said to me. We all realized we had to take these small steps to get to understand each other. After the protests had been going on for a year, by this time they had built, the the barricade they built in the middle of the road had been turned into a permanent structure because they, a lot of people there are construction workers. So they built this, this really nice permanent structure with like a roof and walls and everything. And a guy started, turned up one day named uh, named Tunkai. Um, He was in his early fifties at the time. And, When you meet Tunkai, it's clear he's got some kind of cognitive difficulties um, and he'd been living homeless. But Tunkai had an amazing energy about him. Everyone, he started helping out, hanging around. Everyone liked him. He united the gays, the Muslims and the the punks. And and after he'd been hanging around for a few weeks, the people there realized he was homeless and said, you know, we don't want you to be homeless. You should should come and live in this thing we've built, right? It's quite nice. It's warm. Come and live here. So Tunkai came to live there and he became a much loved part of the Kotti protests. And, and after he'd been there for about a year, one day the police came to inspect. They would do this every now and then. And Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. And, and he thought the police were arguing. So he went to try to hug one of the police officers. But the police officer thought that Tunkai was attacking him. So they arrested Tunkai. Oh. That was when it was discovered Tunkai had been shut away in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years, often literally in a padded cell. He'd escaped one day, he'd been on the streets for a while, and then he found his way to Cotty. So the police took him back to this psychiatric hospital at the other side of Berlin in, in Charlottenburg, at which point the entire Cotty protest 
turned itself into a kind of free Tunkai movement, right? <laughs> they descended on this this psychiatric hospital at the other side of Berlin. And I remember that suddenly, all of a sudden, there's these these psychiatrists are like, what is this? <laughs> they've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years. And suddenly there's these women in hijabs, these very camp gay men and these punks demanding his release. But one of the protesters there, Uli Hartman, said to the psychiatrist, yeah, but the thing is, you don't love him. He doesn't belong with you. We love him. Right. He belongs with us. I, I remember thinking when I heard Uli say that, you know, how many of us in this culture, if someone carried us away to a psychiatric hospital, would have dozens and dozens of people descending to go, no, no, we love this person. We look after this person. You don't do that. We do that. Anyway, many things happened at Cotty. Um, they got Tunkai back. Took a while. He lives there still. Uh, they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project. They then launched a referendum initiative to keep rents down across Berlin. It got the largest number of written signatures in the history of Germany. <laughs> uh, Berlin now has a rent freeze for every property, right? But the last time I saw Nuria, the woman who started all this with that sign in her window, you know, she said to me, I'm really glad I got to stay in my apartment. That's great. I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along and I would never have known. You know, Neriman, one of the other Turkish German women said to me that, you know, when I grew up in, in Turkey, she said, I grew up in a village and I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in the Western world and I learned that here, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls. You're and if you're lucky, your yeah. family. Yeah. And she said she realized, then this whole protest began. And she said, I started to call all these people in this whole place my home. And she said she realized, in some sense, in this culture, we are homeless. You need to feel you belong. And our sense of home is not big enough to meet our sense of belonging. But I also remember, it, it, to me, it was so clear in Cotty, you know, Think about how unhappy these people were. Nuria was about to kill herself. Tunkai was shut away in a padded cell. Loads of the people there were depressed and anxious. They didn't, in the main, need to be drugged. They needed to be together. They needed yep. to be seen. They needed to be valued. They needed to have something meaningful in their lives. And and I remember the the one time I was sitting outside Zublock, that gay club with Tanya, and she said to me, I won't, I don't think I can say the exact word she said on the radio, but she said, you know, when you feel like crap and you're all alone, you think there's something wrong with you. But what we did is we came out of our corner crying and we started to fight and we realized we were surrounded by people who felt the same. And to me, that was one of the most profound revelations of all the people I met in the book and all the countries and all yeah. over the world. Yeah. Uh, so it's so interesting to me that you kind of went straight to that story as well. Well, it's the it's the story of everything that's wrong and everything that can be right, you know. And um, you, I just I just want you to, if you could, um, just go through the that list of disconnections, you know. Well, let's look at a few specific ones. I think sometimes, because sometimes the list can sound a bit weird out of context, but let's okay. look at a few specific ones. So there's one that you kind of, I think, look, alluded. Look, let's do this, because look where we are right now. We're yeah. in the middle of this pandemic where everything that your book shows in a very beautiful and graphic way should not be happening to human beings, you know, in terms of how they live and how they interact with each other is happening right now. So talk about that. Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the, so one of the things I learned in the process of writing my book, Lost Connections, was that actually depression and anxiety have been rising for 40 years now for perfectly understandable reasons because of changes in the way we live that we'll come to in a second. And I think what we've seen obviously in the last two or three months now with this disastrous coronavirus crisis is a further enormous increase in depression and anxiety, right? Now we all know depression and anxiety haven't increased in the last 
you know, two months because there was a sudden change in human biology in our brains, right? That's not why that happened, right? There are real things that happen in your brain when you become depressed and chemical antidepressants give some people some relief and that's a good thing. But that's not why we're depressed, right? We're depressed because our environment changed in very obvious ways. We became much more financially insecure, lots of us. We became lonelier. Uh, we became afraid for the future for perfectly good reasons, right? And, and I think this connects to one thing unites a lot of the causes of depression and anxiety that I learned about, which not all of them, but a lot of them. So everyone listening to your show knows that they have natural physical needs, obviously. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And this culture we built is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive today. Many things are better than in the past. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these basic psychological needs for very large parts of the population. And this is the key reason, not the only one, but the key reason why a crisis of depression and anxiety has been rising and rising and rising. So there are some very obvious ones loneliness right there's obviously been a very big increase in loneliness we didn't evolve to talk to each other through screens we evolved to look into each other's eyes right having screens is better than nothing but it's not what we evolved to, exactly. to need right um, or financial insecurity right and again in some ways i feel like what i'm doing with lost connections is giving people back permission to know really common sense and obvious things i'm sure if you'd said to your grandmother or my grandmother you know grandma do you think if you're lonely, if you're financially insecure, um, if you think life is all about money and status, you're more likely to be depressed. My grandmother would have, you know, clipped me around the ear and said, why are you wasting my time with such obvious questions, right? But what's happened is for a really long time now, we've told a story that's not totally untrue, but is a small part of the picture, the biological explanation for depression. And it's dominated the whole picture. And, and, and it's eclipsed our much more common sense understandings of what's going on. And that's really important because it, what it means is it cuts us off from finding more meaningful solutions. So, you yes, know, that's done. That's done on purpose, Johan, because there's a whole there's a very powerful industry connected to addressing it biologically and chemically. I think there's two things going on. I think you're right. I think there's two things going on. So one is an obvious thing, right? There's a $10 billion industry in telling people that their problem is purely in depression alone, telling people the problem is just in your brain and you just need to drug yourself, right? I'm going to stress again, chemical antidepressants do give some people some relief. Anyone listening to this, if you're one of those people, my advice is to carry on taking them, right? They do give some people some relief. But we've got to be honest, they're not solving the problem for most people, right. as you can tell from the fact that depression and anxiety keep increasing year after year. And as the best long term research into chemical antidepressants, which is called the STAR D trial, shows, it, it follows people over time who are given chemical antidepressants. I thought I was really weird or there was something wrong with me because I took chemical antidepressants. And although I got an initial boost, I actually became depressed again. Turns out I was completely, that's actually the norm. Most people take chemical, anti chemical antidepressants, do get some boost and do become de depressed again. Doesn't mean they have no value, but it means we have to have a much bigger well, sense of means, what's going it on. It means it's, it's addressing it symptomatically and really not the core issue, not you the know, core yeah. problem. I think you're right. You know, there's, there's a moment when, you know, I had lots of scientists explaining this to me. And there was a moment when this different way of thinking about that, and most of the book is not obviously about antidepressants, but it's only a small part of the book, but there was a moment when this different way of thinking about antidepressants really fell into place for me. I went to interview a South African psychiatrist named Dr. Derek Summerfield, who's a great person, and he explained to me, he happened to be in Cambodia uh, researching something else in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants for people in, Cam in that country, in Cambodia. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, had never heard of them. So they were like, what are they? And he explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he said, what do you mean? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy, like, I don't know, St. John's wort or something. Instead, they told him a story. 
there was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine left over from the American war with Southeast Asia and he got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb and um, after a while he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's super painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. And I'm guessing it was pretty traumatic to go back and work in the field where he got blown up. The guy started to cry a lot. After a while, he just refused to get out of bed, right? He developed what we would call classic depression. The Cambodian doctor said to Dr. Summerfield, well, this is when we gave him an antidepressant. And they said, well, Dr. Summerfield said, well, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. When you talked to him, it was perfectly obvious why he was so upset, yeah. right? Yeah. One of the doctors figured, you know, if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position in that was screwed up so much. Exactly. Um, so they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. It never came back. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that it's primarily or entirely just a chemical problem in your brain, that sounds like a bad joke, right? I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively was what the leading medical body in the whole world, the World Health Organization and the leading doctors at the United Nations have been trying to tell us for years. If you're weak, you know, sorry, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not weak, you're not crazy, you're not in the main a machine with broken parts. Yes. Yeah. You're a human being with unmet needs. And what you need is love and practical support to get those needs met. This is why the UN's official statement for World Health Day said when it comes to depression and anxiety, we need to talk less about chemical imbalances and more about the imbalances in the way we live. You know, it's so interesting because you think about it, I mean, that's, oh, it's just so much um, because right now the system <clears throat> for dealing with depression and anxiety uh, is, is basically to either to go to a doctor and get pills or go and talk endlessly. Uh, but what you're saying is, no, you, you need your you need a community or a tribe, your tribe, your people who love you to sit with you and who know you to sit with you, talk to you and literally somehow materially, you know, if necessary, help you. So this whole system that we have set up is, is really woefully in, inadequate. And it's inadequate. It's not, it doesn't, I think it's important to say it doesn't have no value, but it's not enough, right? So stress again that drugs do give well, some relief to some people and therapy does does have some real value. But I think you're right. And one of the, I think you're right that, that, that we need, um, the way I always think of it is we need to radically expand the menu of options, right? Because precisely because this problem goes so much deeper than our biology, the solutions need to go much deeper than our biology too. So that can sound a bit abstract. So I'll just explain two, obviously the last third of my book, Lost Connections, is all about this. But I'll just give you two, the listeners, two very concrete examples of ways we can integrate what you just said and, and act on it, right? People I met who act on it. So one of the heroes of my book is a, a doctor named Sam Everington. He's a doctor in East London, uh, where I lived for a long time, uh, a poor part of East London. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He was a general practitioner. He was seeing all kinds of patients. Um, and like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have some role to play, but he could see two things. Firstly, his patients were depressed and anxious for really kind of understandable reasons almost all of the time like they were lonely and secondly he could he could see that when he gave people chemical antidepressants they gave some relief to some people but a lot of them became depressed again so one day he decided to pioneer a different approach a woman came to see him named lisa cunningham who i got to know later and sam said to lisa don't worry i'll carry on giving you these drugs but i'm also going to prescribe something else i'd like you to come to this these offices twice a week to meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people, not to talk about how depressed and anxious you are. You can do that if you want, but that's not the point of it. I want you guys to find something 
meaningful to do together. So the first time the group met, Lisa literally started vomiting with anxiety. It was just so much for her, right? But the group started talking. They were like, what could we do? These are inner city East London people like me. They didn't know anything about gardening. But they were like, shall we? There was an area behind the doctor's offices that was just like scrubland. They're like, well, should we turn that into a garden? So they started to watch YouTube clips about gardening. They started to get books out the library. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to plant seeds. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. There's a lot of evidence that exposure to the natural world is a really powerful antidepressant. But they started to do something even more important, a bit like what happened in Cotty. They started to form a tribe. They started to form a group. They started to care about each other. If one of them didn't show up, they'd go looking for them, say, hey, what's going on? Find out what was upsetting them, solve that problem if they could, right? Um, the way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a very similar program, found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. And this is because of something I saw all over the world from San Francisco to Sydney to Sao Paulo. The most effective strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety are the ones that deal with the reasons why we feel this way in the first place. So that approach is called social prescribing. It is much cheaper than drugging people, right? It literally costs nothing to make but a garden. But that's the or... problem with it. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's, that's I mean, a structural I mean, barrier to it being implemented. I agree, yeah. You know, I, first of all, let's, we'll get back to that. But, you know, I'm thinking about what's going on now, too, because, you know, one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on was because your book is, is so timely, given what we're all going through right now, right? There's this whole structure in place to thwart everything you're talking about. And I'm going to give you a personal example here. Please, I'm yes. in, in a neighborhood, you know, in the middle of New Jersey. You know, everybody kind of knows each other, you know, says, oh, but, but we don't, you know. And I know there are people out there suffering. And every year, Johan, I think, oh, I'd like to have a block party out here. I'd like to organize a block party. And something blocks me like, oh, I don't want people to think that, you know, I'm intruding on them. I'm, I'm completely programmed to, like, not bother people, be a good neighbor by maintaining your house and doing whatever you have to do, you know. And, and yeah, if your neighbor, you know, but I don't know what my neighbors do or don't need. My neighbor here just told me that a friend of hers is starving now because they're all in their entire family. Everybody lost their job. And, and again, it's like, I'm programmed. I'm programmed not to seek those connections like that. You know, when I know that really I should be doing that. I should, you know, be I think that's, I think that's so interesting and such an important and heart rending thing to say. And I think a lot of us feel that way. And I think that I thought that a lot of Cotty because I think you can tell from the way I talk about them and write about them. I love those people at Cotty. Yes, of but in many ways, they're not exceptional. They were just random people who came together. And that hunger, for, this is one of the things I learned at Cotty, that hunger for reconnection is just beneath the surface for everyone. The way we're living just is not compatible with human nature. And, you know, there's a, a real... Um, one of the people who taught me a lot about this, um, I was thinking about this as you were telling me that, um, and I, I was embarrassed by how challenging I found this and discovery, because it's in, these are very, in some ways they're very basic things that we've gone wrong at a very basic level, right? Yeah. Um, I went to interview this woman called Dr. Brett Ford, who at the time was a professor in Berkeley, she's in Toronto now. And she, with a team of other academics, she did across the world, she did this really, both basic and revelatory research. It's a really simple experiment. I wanted to figure out, let's say your listener, random listener hearing this, if you spent two hours a day trying to make yourself happier, would you actually become happier, right? They were trying to figure out, does consciously pursuing happiness work? And they did this research in four countries, in the United States, in Russia, in Taiwan, and in Japan. And when they got the results back, at first it just seemed like there was something wrong with them. What they found is, in the United States, if you try deliberately to make yourself happier, you do not become happier. 
But in the other three places, if you try deliberately to make yourself happier, you do become happier. And they were like, well, how can that be? What's going on here? Then they looked at it in more detail and did some more research. And what they discovered was in the United States, if you try to make yourself happier, in the main, what you do is you do something for yourself. You go shopping. You, yeah. you go shopping. Or you work harder to get a promotion or you show off on Instagram or whatever it is. You do something for you. And of course, there were exceptions, but mostly that was the case. Yeah, yeah. In the other countries, in the main, if you tried to make yourself happier, you did something for someone else, your friends, your family, your community. So we have an instinctively individualistic idea of what it means to be happy. And they have an instinctively collective idea of what it means to be happy. And it turns out individualism just doesn't work well for human beings. We would never have survived on the savannas of Africa if we hadn't been able to band together into tribes, right? Just like bees evolved to live in a hive, humans evolved to live in a tribe. We are the first humans ever to try to disband our tribes and it is making us feel awful right so i think that instinct you have i think about think about nuria right the person who woman who, who amazing woman who puts that sign in her window saying she's going to kill herself right um lets out this cry for help you know nuria thought she was all alone and she was the only person who cared about this but she put out that signal and so many people around her were like yeah, I feel like that too. And it was that moment. So I really think organizing that block party is a really, really good idea. I know. But I think there's also there's yeah. also um, bigger structural things. It goes to, I was very struck by what you said about your neighbor who, you know, knows, uh, has people who have family or, or friends who are, who are starving, right? So um, obviously there's been an, so there's very good evidence that economic insecurity causes depression and anxiety right now in many ways you explain that to people and you think my god did you really need a load of scientists to explain that to you right it's it would not have been news to your grandmother or my grandmother right but so there's been this big increase in economic insecurity since the election of ronald reagan essentially as there's been a transfer of wealth to the rich and a collapse of the middle class big increase in financial insecurity and at the same time not coincidentally, big increase in depression and anxiety. Obviously, in the current crisis, there's been an explosion in economic insecurity. This is the biggest... Um, an explosion in isolation. Yeah. So both of those things, which are... Cat each of them is catastrophic separately, and together they yeah. are even more catastrophic. Now, let's think about on the principle of the cow, right? You gave the guy a cow and it ended his depression... One of the things we've got to be asking now, and a big part of what my book Lost Connections is about, is, okay, what are the cows for the things that are screwing us up, right? So it turns out there's a, if we think about the financial insecurity component, lots of people listening to this will um, be feeling financially, will literally be financially insecure, uh, and it will be making them terribly anxious and depressed. If that's the case, you're not crazy. It's not a deficiency in you. One of the things we have to do is shift our understanding. Up to now, what we've done is we've treated depression and anxiety. We've been told that they are basically malfunctions in our heads, right? Biological malfunctions. And what I had to learn yeah, is... Yeah, lack of uh, serotonin in the brain. Exactly. It's never what, been measured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and what I had to learn was these aren't malfunctions, they're signals, Right. They're telling us something. And what we've been doing up to now is insulting the signal uh, by saying it's a sign of weakness or madness or just it's purely biological. But, but once you see it in this different way as a signal that something's gone wrong, you can begin to build solutions. So let's think about the financial insecurity, right, which is making people depressed for very, very obvious and correct reasons, right? Um, what can we do about that? Well, there was a really interesting experiment that was done in Canada in the early 1970s that, that found one of the most effective antidepressants ever, right? So I would argue anything that reduces depression and anxiety should be seen as an antidepressant, right? And that right. shouldn't just be a category of to drugs. So what they did is the Canadian government chose a town. They seem to have genuinely chosen a town at random. It's called Dauphin. Um, in, it's in Manitoba. It's about four hours away from Winnipeg, for people who know that part of Canada. And they said to a large number of people in Dauphin, OK, from now on, we're going to give you a guaranteed basic income. There is nothing you have to do in return for it, these monthly checks. And there's nothing you can do that means we'll take it away unless you go to prison. Right. And it was the equivalent of giving them 
uh, about twelve thousand dollars in today's U.S. money. So it's not a huge, it's not a fortune, right? You're not going to be homeless with twelve thousand dollars a year, but nor are you going to be having any luxuries or a fancy life, right? We said to people, "You're a citizen of our country. We want you to have a decent life." We want to see what happens. So this experiment went on for a few years, and it was monitored by social scientists, uh, particularly a wonderful social scientist named Dr. Evelyn Forget, who looked, okay, what happened to these people? Lots of interesting things happened. Interestingly, nobody gave up work. Some people um, stayed out of the workforce slightly longer after they had babies because they wanted to spend more time with their children, and some people studied longer. But other than that, there was no effect on employment. People carried on working. But Loads of positive things happened. From our, the purposes of our conversation, the most important was there was a massive fall in all mental health problems. In fact, mental health problems that were so serious, people had to be shut away in psychiatric hospitals, fell really significantly, right? In fact, they fell at a level that you will never find a drug that causes that level of fall in mental well, that's health. because right. the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs was met. I mean, if you know that you can keep body and soul together then it allows for your creative mind and your, you know, it allow, gives you breathe. You can breathe so that you can do things, you know. But here in this country, first of all, you don't have that. Secondly, um, if you are depressed and stuff and you do have financial problems, that's something to be ashamed of to add, you know, to your being depressed that you can't move to the left or the right because you have no money to do that. And 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 then you're you're not encouraged to reach out to anybody because, you know, you should you should be standing on your own. And then you're watching TV all day and the advertisements are telling you you should get this, you should get that and you should take this pill if you feel bad and, you know, I mean, it's we're in this I mean, I see your book as a solution. I'm just trying to figure out this box that we've been put in by these industries and by, like, that guy who said, you know, advertising literally shits in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. So, so, and now, and now we're in COVID pandemic and, you know, they keep saying, oh, this could go on forever, you know? So now you and I will... You know, can, will we ever be able to touch each other? You know, say hello, shake hands, give a hug? I don't know. So where do we go from here? Well, I think that, that what you've just said is, there's so many things in what you just said, isn't there, Christina? So one thing is it's, it's understandable in these very disturbing times, obviously not just COVID, but the election of Donald Trump and his absolutely depraved behavior ever since yeah i mean there's but, also the, there's also the i'm sorry just to interrupt for sure. a second there's also the the rewarding of pathology of pathological behavior um if you judge it in terms of what you know average humans need you know what the hu basic human needs but it's Can really important for people guys? to bear in mind uh, as we talk about this that progressive change is possible and we are all the beneficiaries of those progressive changes, right? My grandmothers weren't allowed to have bank accounts in their own names when they got married, right? That's not that long ago. You know, the current extraordinary uprising we're seeing against racism in the United States, it would have been unimaginable. I mean, when in 1968, when there was an uprising, about 10% of white people thought that there was some justice in the protests. Today, it's more than 60%. Even a majority of Republican voters think there's some justice well, in it's this. it's global, too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, global you know, is that is itself a sign of extraordinary yeah. progressive change. When I get depressed about this, I think, oh, God, we're up against such powerful forces. I often think of a friend of mine. Um, so in 1994, my friend Andrew Sullivan, who's a writer, was diagnosed as HIV positive at the height of the last pandemic, right? Um, when they're... As far as he knew and as far as anyone knew, there was no hope in sight. We didn't have any antiretrovirals. And Andrew had just watched one of his closest friends, Patrick, die of AIDS. And he thought, well, I'm going to die very soon. And he decided he was going to do one last thing before he died. He, he quit his job and he went to a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod. And he decided he was going to write a book about a crazy utopian idea that no one had ever written a book about. And he said, well, like, I'm not going to live to see this idea, obviously not going to live to see this idea 
come up to anything. No one alive today is going to live to see it, but maybe 50 years from now, someone will pick up this idea, right? The idea Andrew wrote the first ever book advocating was gay marriage. And when I get depressed, I try to imagine going back in time to 1994 to Provincetown, saying to Andrew, okay, Andrew, you're not going to believe me, but 26 years from now, well, first thing, you'll be alive. That would have blown his mind. Secondly, you'll be married to a man because it'll be legal. Thirdly, the Supreme Court of the United States will quote this book you're writing now when it makes it mandatory for every state to introduce gay marriage. And I'll be with you when the next day the president of the United States invites you to go to the White House that will be lit up in the colors of the rainbow flag to have dinner with him to celebrate what you and so many other people have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that president who's going to invite you to do that, he's going to be black, right? <laughs> Every aspect of that would have sounded like the most, it was like science fiction. It'd be me saying to you, okay, Christina, I know you feel bad now, but 26 years from now, a transgender president is going to invite us to smoke crack with her in the Oval Office, right? It would have sounded <laughs> preposterous, right? It happened. It didn't happen by magic. It happened because people didn't give up because they banded together, they, they appealed they to other people. Exactly. They started where they stood. They appealed to the people around them. They kept going through very dark times, times that were, you know, where there seemed to be no hope at all. Right. Uh, you know, and, and they prevailed. We prevailed. Right. I'm gay myself. So it's really important to bear in mind that. So when I articulate, for example, the evidence that a universal basic income uh, would massively reduce depression and anxiety. Right. It's, uh, it's worth remembering universal basic income is only slightly more expensive than the massive corporate bailout that Donald Trump just did, right? This And, and you know, the, the most popular politician in the United States, Bernie Sanders, is advocating very similar policies. Um, all sorts of changes are possible when we demand change and fight for them and keep fighting and keep fighting. So I think part of it, and there's another thing here, which is I think in what you said that's so important, which is you said, you know, um, people, when they become financially insecure, they blame themselves, they feel ashamed. Part one, another one of the things I learned at Cotty is, to some degree, the struggle is the solution. Coming together and fighting for a big change destigmatizes depression because you realize you're surrounded by people who feel terrible. And we all feel it for similar reasons, whether it's loneliness, traumatic childhoods, financial insecurity, a whole range of things I go through in Lost Connections. And the act of coming together and realizing, oh, it's not just me. And the causes aren't just in my head. Actually, it's happening to huge numbers of people. And together, we can fight to change that, even if it takes a long time for some of these changes. And some of the changes that have to happen will take a long time. The struggle is a key part of the solution. But there's another thing in relation to what you were saying that I've been thinking about a lot as we've been talking, Christina. So another aspect of this crisis, you know, this is a horrendous crisis and huge numbers of people have, have died and and it's an irredeemable and unnecessary tragedy. Um, but there are some opportunities in this tragedy as well. And one is, I think, this is an opportunity to question the dysfunctional values that have begun to prevail in the culture in the lead up to this crisis. So everyone knows that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick. I don't say that with any sense of superiority. KFC just started delivering again yesterday and I was first in queue, so I'm not saying that with any superiority, but just like junk food has taken over our diets, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're going to feel like crap. Right? That's not an exact quote from Schopenhauer, but that is basically what he said. But weirdly, nobody had scientifically investigated this until an incredible man I got to know named Professor Tim Kasser who was until recently at Knox College in Illinois, he just retired. And Professor Cassid discovered loads of things, but there are two that I think are really important for purposes of this conversation. Firstly, Professor Cassid discovered the more you think life, life is about having more money than other people and status and showing off, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious uh, to a really significant degree. Yeah, you, secondly, become, you become a hungry ghost. You can't you can't get enough. Yeah, it's insatiable, right? You, you, it trains you to look for happiness in all the wrong places. Yeah. And, and secondly, Professor Kasser discovered that as a society, as a culture, we have become much more driven by these values, 
all throughout my lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I remember as Professor Kasser was explaining his scientific findings to me and I was sitting with him and we were going through it, I'm thinking in some ways this is quite banal, right? We all know, everyone listening knows, none of, them, none of you are going to lie on your deathbed and think about all the shoes you bought and all the likes you got on Instagram, right? You're going to think about moments of love and meaning and connection. But as Professor Kasser put it to me, we live in a machine that is designed to get us to neglect what is important about life. It was such a challenging thing, right? We live in a machine that's designed to get us to neglect what's important about life. Um, we've been trained to look for happiness in the wrong places. You know, more 18 month old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name. From the moment we're born, we're immersed in this machine which says, if you don't feel good, hey, there's a solution to that. Go shopping, buy something, display it to make other people envious. And I think in a way, there's a moment in this crisis where we see how dysfunctional those values have become. When our backs were against the wall, when we were in terrible crisis, who did we need? Who did we turn to? It wasn't Wall Street bankers. It wasn't Instagram influencers. It wasn't, you know, uh, reality TV stars and the president they one of them became. It was people we had devalued and shit on for a really long time. It was shelf stackers who kept us alive. It was nurses. It was bus drivers. It was delivery guys, right? Um, uh, uh, and by the way, those have always been the people who kept us alive. It's just it that we didn't see it for a long time, right? Um, and, and this is a moment to reevaluate our values. We can see a society and culture that had devalued things like nursing and teaching and garbage collection. And I mean, I think about the jobs my family did. My grandmother cleaned toilets. My dad was a bus driver. My brother is an Uber driver. You think about the devaluation of people who do these kinds of work. A society that had done that, a society that devalued the people who kept them alive, kept us alive, had gone really wrong. And that had actually exalted people who contribute nothing. People are in fact parasites on the society. Wall Street bankers, Donald Trump, <laughs> you know, a whole range of people. Um, but we don't have to carry on like that, right? This is a moment, and I think intuitively, almost everyone, including, by the way, quite right-wing and conservative people, at some level know that truth, right? Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. I have it. Celia, are you there? Yes, I'm listening with I'd uh, like to give you the final attention. word, because I knew you want, you had something you I wanted to so say. Much to say. Hi, Celia. I so much to say. Hi, Johan. Thank you so much for your amazing work. And I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm struck by, okay, we only have a few minutes. I wanted to return to the subject of depression and COVID because I'm somebody who has um, suffered with and, and thrown everything at a pretty serious depression over many years. And I'm really challenged uh, since the lockdown, and we're, we're all really challenged. I was just looking at a Washington Post article about um, the enormous, I think it said it was a thousand percent increase in calls to a suicide hotline. I don't know what the numbers are. Maybe you know how many, we don't need the numbers, but we know suicides have gone up as, as we've said. And I wonder what, what, what do you think people can do? See, when I hear the Tony Fauci's and the Bill Gates's say, oh, there's not going to be a new normal. Don't think you're ever going to be able to just shake anybody's hand. I get such an anxiety attack and I go into learned helplessness and I try to tell myself it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But the media machine um, and the medical industrial machine, which has an agenda here, which we're not entirely clear what it is yet. I feel they're pumping out this message all the time. Learn to live without that, which as you have documented, you must have to survive. What yeah. would you say to them if you were in a room with those architects, Tony Fauci at all? So I would say, I mean, I, I would separate Fauci from Bill Gates. I think they're kind of different. <laughs> they're, they're, Fauci's a more admirable person than Bill Gates, although that's not difficult. Um, I would, guess I would say to you, I'm more interested in talking to you than to them in a funny way and, and, to, and to everyone else because we can pressure them, right? I would say there's two core points. The first thing is know that your pain makes sense and we are all feeling it. So don't let people pathologize your pain. Don't let them people tell you you're crazy or there's just something wrong with your brain. This is a set. Your reaction is a sane reaction. 
right to a very painful and difficult situation so the fact that you feel distressed is proof of your sanity you know um the indian philosopher krishnamurti said it's no sign of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society and the fact that you're not adjusting to this is a sign that you are a sane and healthy person the second thing in addition to your pain makes sense is i'd say you are powerful we are powerful right we can change these situations we can challenge and change them in all sorts of um in all sorts of ways as people before us have the weekend was a radical and crazy idea when trade unionists first proposed it in the late 19th century now it's unthinkable that anyone would try and take away the weekend right so together as citizens we are able to demand change as these uprisings across the united states are showing now some of us won't want to go onto the streets because of the risk of infection, in which case there's a lot we can do to organise online, to support each other and to demand political change. Um, so I, I would say um, that the worst thing to feel is is helpless in this situation because you're not helpless. Oh. You're deeply powerful. As citizens, there is, what was it Margaret Mead said? Never doubt that a few organised citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. So... We have to end it on that. You have oh. been amazing. You oh, are thanks so the much. champion in my eyes. <laughs> oh, I should just say, anyone who wants to know anything, uh, my publishers tase me if I don't say this. Anyone who wants to know anything more about the book can go and get the audio book or the ebook as well. If you go to www.thelostconnections.com, you can also listen for free to loads of interviews with lots of the people we mentioned, including those people in Berlin. You can listen to lovely interviews with them and loads of the experts that I met and a whole load of different people. But I'm so grateful to you guys and having me on the show. And would you promise you will organize that block party next year? I will. I do you will. swear? I'm going to hold you to this. Keep you, no, I'm going to try to do it this summer. I'll keep you posted. Brilliant. I'll hold you to it too. And I'll be there too. I'll Excellent. come in from the city. Uh, Amazing. Oh, thank you wait. both so much. I really appreciate it. Take thank care. Thank you, Johan. Cheers. Thank you. Keep Enjoy going. That. Thank I you. Love you.